Is your friend posting pictures with a flash when the flash really isn't needed? Are they looking downtrodden or maybe even sickly? Wearing skinny pants and little fur scarves? Possibly only listening to the newest obscure electronic pop? Well, they might have a case of indie sleaze. Indie sleaze is one of the hottest new trends happening right now. But what makes it kind of different or unique is, is that it encompasses a lot of different things. It's not just clothing, but it's also photography and music. So today I wanna get into that and explore it and find out what even is indie sleaze? Indie sleaze is what we would call a reoccurring trend, meaning that while it is popular now, it actually has origins in an earlier trend. The first era of indie sleaze was from 2006 to 2012, but we actually have to go even further back than that to find out where indie sleaze actually comes from. We actually have to go back to the early 2000s to the New York indie rock revival. In the early 2000s, indie bands like The Strokes and Interpol were starting to make waves in New York. They were sort of rehashing indie garage rock culture and music. Think of bands like The Velvet Underground. There's really a whole cultural scene that came around these indie garage rock bands, and they're just kind of their own little subculture. In the 2000s, the world was rapidly changing, and this would evolve this indie rock scene. The internet was evolving and getting better and better, and this would unleash the blog era. The second was the Great Recession of 2007. These two events really affected indie rock culture until it created a new subsect and new culture altogether called indie sleaze. First, let's talk about how blogs really affected and shaped this scene. Before the blog era, the internet was kind of like this place full of information and chat boards. It was sort of great for finding like information on businesses, your local library. And while there were definitely gimmick websites that would blow up, the idea that someone could have their own website and really draw interest to it in a serious way wasn't really popular. But as the internet evolved and became more advanced, it made it easier for people or groups of people to create their own website. These websites that people could easily make were called blogs. And blogs really democratized the internet on a whole different level and really started to shift culture as a whole, especially with music. Sites like Pitchfork, Pigeons and Planes, Stereo Gum, made discovering and talking about music a lot easier. Before the internet or the blog era, discovering music was a lot more difficult. Like you had to have a personal relationship with someone who was very in tune to an underground scene. Blog era made it so that independent artists could be easily shared and gain popularity over the internet. And these people who were specifically into indie rock were now having access to all these blogs. Indie rock people, instead of just being interested in indie rock, were hearing independent rap and independent electronic. And so while indie did come from indie rock, it really became something that encapsulated all musical genres. Some great examples of artists that were really popularized by the indie sleaze scene include Crystal Castles, Sky Fiera, M.I.A., Grimes, Azalea Banks, Ariel Pink, Purity Ring, LCD Sound System, Jai Paul, MGMT, Justice. Being an indie sleaze artist was pretty much a surefire way to make sure you'd get canceled in 10 years. But that was what indie sleaze was for music, but also we know that clothing or or style was a big part of indie sleaze too. Now the style aspect of it is a little bit more complex as there's a lot of different influences that went into the indie sleaze style. But like I said, originally indie sleaze came from the indie rock star scene and a huge person who influenced that rock star style of that era was Heidi Sleman. While Sleman definitely did not have a huge impact on the early 2000s indie rock scene, as he sort of became the creative director of Dior around the same time the strokes were blowing up, he sort of grew alongside the indie rock scene. And so by the time that indie sleaze became popular, his version of rock was what defined indie sleaze. For example, the leather jackets, the jeans. For example, he made all of those silhouettes super, super slim and skinny. Also popularized a lot of accessories, uh, for example, scarves, fur coats. And so when you look at a lot of musical acts from the indie sleaze era, for example, Justice or Crystal Castles, they were wearing Heidi Slomane's work. Jeremy Scott was also very popular and important during this time, and he popularized a lot of loud, colorful, vibrant prints. From Jeremy Scott, you see a lot of purple and neon becoming popular, as well as a lot of patterns that are kind of funky. 
uh, like the animal print. You also have to remember that another thing that was happening was the Great Recession. The Great Recession was obviously a huge economic downturn. And so this had a huge impact on the style from that era. Very much made indie sleaze as a style very grungy as well. Now part of this was because people didn't have a lot of extra money so they were thrifting their clothes and the clothes might have been a little extra grungy or worn in. But this sort of grungy vibe also played a part in the styling. When you see indie sleaze it's very reminiscent of the layering and styling of the 2000s, but it's a little bit more downtrodden and sloppy, which is sort of an intentional choice to reflect the economic conditions, which is very interesting. Then, of course, another huge impact on the style of this era was the brand American Apparel. A lot of this was due to the fact that their designers really fed into this scene, as well as their marketing, tapped into the aesthetics of indie sleaze. And that gives us a good segue to talk about the indie sleaze photography element of it. And so sort of the whole general zeitgeist or movement that kind of came with indie sleaze was sort of like hey we're in a recession let's just party through it this is sort of a strange sentiment that definitely requires some privilege but I think it's just kind of young people's natural reaction when they can't really do much about it. This is also where the uh, sleaze in the indie sleaze comes in. It's a combination of the messy grungy look, but also really this attitude. To be blunt, uh, partying as like a culture was sort of seen as mm, distasteful in the midst of uh, an economy that was in shambles and a lot of people losing their jobs. And so this was kind of looked at as kind of trashy or sleazy. Whatever it may be, what you really have to get is that the indie sleaze scene was really big into partying. This was just around the same time that digital photography was sort of becoming widely accessible, whether it be on a handheld phone or a handheld little digital camera. Because of this, everyone had a camera and could take a digital photo. So lo-fi party photography became huge at the time. People were able to easily document their parties, their outfit, the music and the concerts they were going to. And a lot of people would share their own uh, photos on their blog. And so this is kind of what Indie Sleaze was. A bunch of people partying through the recession and listening to their favorite blog era artists. Okay, so now that we know what the original Indie Sleaze is, I want to talk about the Indie Sleaze revival that's happening right now in the 2020s. But you might be wondering, why is it even reviving? Why are people dressing like this again? Why is this music becoming popular again? And something I notice when we talk about the Indie Sleaze revival is that when people talk about it, they don't understand why it's happening again, but also the differences about it. The Indie Sleaze revival really comes from a specific music scene in LA. That term was first coined to describe a subgenre of electronic synth-based pop. I'm talking about artists like The Dare, Damon Rush, Two Hollis, uh, The Frost Children. But the ones that really kicked off the genre are Snow Strippers and The Help. So, electronic music very much went out of vogue in around 2012. It's like Snow Strippers and The Help, who started kind of coming into fruition in the early 2020s, started to revive this synth-based electronic style of music. And while they were reviving this synth-based electronic style of music, they were also reviving the aesthetics of the indie sleaze era as well. So the Snow Strippers of a Detroit-based electronic duo that are sort of the bling ring era of indie sleaze, if you will, while the Help are sort of a dark LA-based duo that are just kind of obsessed with the Heidi Slaman being skinny bit. The Snow Strippers and the Help were heavily influenced instead by synth-based electronic pop from the Indie Sleaze era. They were influenced by Crystal Castles, Purity Ring, um, Justice. But something to note is, is that while they were definitely inspired by the Indie Sleaze era, a lot of their influences and sound came from outside of Indie Sleaze by Salem, Shoo Shoo, Aphex Twin. And Salem in particular really separates these acts from feeling just like a lazy rehash of older music. A Greta Van Fleet, if you will, of Indie Sleaze, so while these acts definitely have elements of the OG indie sleaze, such as the pop sensibility, the synth-based electronics, there are also parts of them that make them very dark and avant-garde and noisy that kind of separate them from the original indie sleaze. And so when the Snow Strippers and the Help started to really co-opt the indie sleaze aesthetic and sound, a scene sort of grew around them and more artists started kind of doing that as well. And this sort of became the indie sleaze music genre scene. First biggest difference between indie sleaze and indie sleaze revival 
is that Indie Sleaze's revival, the music of it, is a particular music scene and genre. The original Indie Sleaze, if you'll remember, was just sort of whatever was popular with the blog era. It was rap, it was rock, it was electronic. But Indie Sleaze Revival is a particular subgenre. All right, let's talk about the clothes with the Indie Sleaze Revival. I'm just gonna be honest here, this is like exactly the same as before. Uh, people pretty much have like the exact same references, Kate Moss from this era, the Olsen twins, Sky Fiera. It's, it's pretty much all the same. Maybe the only difference is it's a little bit more toned down these days. There's a lot less of the bright colors and the Jeremy Scott influence, but it's still that same kind of thrifted, grungy, uh, skinny rock star hipster look. And it just really hasn't changed that much. Except now we have blood thinner instead of American apparel. But the second biggest difference with the Indie Sleaze revival and original Indie Sleaze is in the photography and visuals. Now, the original Indie Sleaze were really dominated by party photography. So you remember this party photography was noticeably lo-fi. And the reason for that was is that the phones and the cameras were just not that high quality. Technology wasn't that good where everyone could take a perfect photo all the time. So the photography at that time is a little bit more lo-fi, if you will. But something with the Indie Sleaze revival that's somewhat similar is this lo-fi quality of the visuals and the aesthetic. Now, while I think for some people in the Indie Sleaze revival, this might intentionally be influenced by that original party photography, but I think if you were to ask most of the people in the Indie Sleaze revival, it definitely doesn't come from the original Indie Sleaze. I think a lot of the visuals and aesthetics of the Indie Sleaze revival actually come from Jurgen Teller. And Jurgen Teller is a very famous and important photographer today. So normally when you shoot on a digital camera these days, there is no evidence that you shot on a digital camera, except for an absence of character that you get when you shoot on film. Jurgen Teller, however, is a rare type of photographer who uses a digital camera, but makes you very aware that he shot on a digital camera with his photographs. Imprint of the tool is left on the final product and it builds character on the final product just in the way that film does. The character you're seeing is through the flash and other ways that Jurgen Teller manipulates his digital photos. Noah Dillon, who's in The Help, who handles a lot of the visuals in The Help, uh, is super influenced by Jurgen Teller. Other people who have really built on the Indie Sleaze aesthetic and brought something new to the Indie Sleaze revival include Ayo Deji. He's worked on a lot of the music videos. Ayo Deji has worked extensively with Snow Strippers and The Help to kind of craft this new visual style of Indie Sleaze revival. Someone else who's really helped out is Tommy Pointer. Tommy Pointer has also helped push a lot of the Indie Sleaze revival into the culture more. And I think that really brings me into the biggest difference between Indie Sleaze revival and Indie Sleaze, the original movement, is, is that the intention and the attitude and maybe the zeitgeist of the movement is really different. Look, when it comes to the original Indie Sleaze, it wasn't super deep. Now, let me make this clear, don't get me wrong. I think there's a lot of important art that did have cultural criticism when it came to the original Indie Sleaze movement. For example, Crystal Castles, Grimes, um, a lot of those artists had something interesting to say. And I'm not trying to discount their art. But when you look at the original Indie Sleaze movement as a whole, overall, there's not a lot of deep things happening. It's just kind of about partying in general. But as the Indie Sleaze revival has come in, it's really more focused on sort of an artistic statement, really focused on deconstructing America and American culture. Also like the beauty of American culture in a way too. I mentioned this band Salem earlier. Salem has a really huge impact on the music of the Indie Sleaze revival. Um, and that's in their sound, but also in their attitude. Besides Salem, two other figures who have a huge impact on sort of the philosophy of the Indie Sleaze revival would be uh, filmmaker Vincent Gallo and author David Foster Wallace. Now, Salem, Vincent Gallo, and David Foster Wallace are all very different, but what sort of unites them is they have a pretty nuanced and unique attitude when it comes to American culture. From their influence, the Indie Sleaze revival definitely has a strange appreciation for America, um, particularly middle America and rural America, which is just something that's not very highly regarded or even talked about in media or art. Middle and rural America is rarely talked about in media and art, but what's even more shocking is sort of an acknowledgement or praise for the sort of beauty of rural America. This isn't something that really happens outside of country music. 
um, and it really hasn't happened in a significant way outside of country music since like the 50s and the 60s. And so Indie Slee's revival sort of having this huge theme of appreciation for rural America is incredibly different. And there is sort of a nuance. There is an acknowledgement of, for example, the devastating realities of the opioid addiction in rural America and how the aftershocks of the Great Recession have affected middle America particularly. So it's not this purely romantic view that you see in like country music. It's nuanced and it's different. Also in the philosophy of Indie Slee's revival, there's this criticism of urban lifestyle and particularly the consumerism of urban lifestyle and the hedonism of urban lifestyle, which just is not normal for an artistic movement. Almost every artistic movement um, praises an urban lifestyle. There's also a uh, self-awareness and irony involved because obviously the artists in this movement uh, are mainly in Los Angeles. I think this is why the Indie Sleaze revival really interests me. Nothing against the original Indie Sleaze, I really like Crystal Castles, but the trend doesn't interest me as much as the revival. Being a kid who grew up in the Midwest and spent a lot of time in the rural Midwest, this movement really interests me because of that. While right now I live on the West Coast, I've always been conscious about how the media I consume uh, really comes from a coastal perspective, and the lifestyle from the coasts to middle America is just so vastly different. The media and art we mainly consume just doesn't have the nuances that come with coming from a rural, background or a middle America background. And so that's why I think the Indie Sleaze revival movement really interests me is because it really considers and understands this perspective of being from rural and middle America, particularly being from rural or middle America and moving to the coasts. And so that's kind of where I want to leave you with Indie Sleaze and Indie Sleaze revival. I hope you guys learned something from this video and found it interesting. If you want to see more videos like this, uh, give me a follow, give me a like. My name is Karsten Craning. Um, thank you again for watching this video and have a wonderful day.